Okay, no problem. Greetings, everybody. Nathan Nerdark here from Nerdarchy for Nerds by Nerds. We are doing some world building today, and with me, I've. All right, try it again. Yes, I see what happened here. Okay. <laughs> I have some problems going on here. Hold on a minute. Okay. Oh wait. I know. You do you know what happened? Uh. <laughs> I know. I what see. Happened. Uh pizza commercial in the background or something and something that says sneaky pete <laughs> there that is uh that's definitely not what we want up on the screen hi everybody how's it going <laughs> yes so now we're back sneaky and, uh, pete got us <laughs> yeah so a little bit of error there pretty new mistake but hey it's new to streaming for me anyway so what I want to talk about is the Merchant Circle Road. And mm. the Merchant Circle Road is part of an area that I have some of my players playing in in the Hold the More Danes campaign. And the centerpiece of the Hold the More Danes campaign is the More Dane Mountain Range. And that goes from up north to, of the circle. It's a pretty big circle. It's like a couple hundred miles across, you'd say. Uh, and it encompasses 12 city-states. Right. And what we've got there is we have nine of those city-states are through forest and through mining areas and through a desert area. And then what we have is three island city-states. And those island city-states are what we're going to focus on today. And the islands that encompass them as well as the islands kind of in there so what we have is uh, a long long time ago the, people say the islands fell uh, the mountains fell into the sea and that's kind of what it looks like but that's not what happened what happened was there was an impact and that created the circle area of the island chains that are known that are seen there today and what the people of the region says that's kind of like the mythos is that the mountains um, were consumed by the sea. So, as far and, as hmm? and we we had a geology discussion immediately leading up to this uh, about how mountains could be in the sea, and essentially every island is a mountain in the sea, if that makes any sense, uh, or in the ocean or whatever. Uh, so we have three of them we're working on. And what we're doing with them is everything? Uh, kind of everything. I, it's, okay. it's a big area, first off. The merchant circles themselves, this is why I'm tackling the sea part first. The merchant circle's huge. It has 12 city-states. They kind of are self-governing, but they're all linked together through this kind of... Um, it's almost like a massive... It's like a, it's like a massive guild. So at this point, I would say maybe it's like a partnership rather than, you know, a giant corporation. It's like a partnership of cities. They all are self-governing, but they all um, interact. They're very tightly linked, economically speaking, because of their, because of their position on the merchant circle. 
Okay, and that, that brings up actually a really great direction we can use as far as attacking this. And hello, all of the wonderful people who stayed through our explosion right in the beginning of the stream. Uh, so the direction we could attack this from is we, we, I'm, I'm coming from the position of knowing nothing about the islands. Yes. Okay. So it, coming from the position of knowing nothing about the islands, can we assume that the reason these islands, because there are lots of questions about city states, like how they preserve their independence, things like that. So, uh, these islands have preserved their independence, I assume by being valuable trading partners. Yes, I mean you've got all okay. the you know the bounty of the sea. You have the the things that are not really found elsewhere, mm -hmm. that are only really found within the island chains. Whether it's special magic coral or um, special magic coral, I, no. that sounds awesome. Why I'm down. Giant giant clams with magical pearls and stuff like that. I'm totally in. Yeah, so uh, James Leslie, to answer, are there volcanic islands, crushed up mountainous plates, land masses, or ma masses grown on the back of giant turtles? I can answer this question. <laughs> <laughs> go ahead, go for it. Uh, so geologically, we have several courses of action, but as it was described to me, uh, the, the, the appearance we wanted to go for was a cup, like uh, the edge of the cup is where the islands are. So you get like a kind of a, a, a half moon of islands. There are a few ways to achieve this. You can use a hot plume of magma, which uh, pops up a little underwater mountain that turns into an island. That's what the island chain of Hawaii is. Uh, you can use two sections of, of continental crust that are smacking into each other, and they literally push the islands right up, and that would include volcanic activity. There are a lot of directions we wanted to go in, but Nate said something, and I was like, that, that's kind of so awesome. I think it's what we're doing whether whether it would really work that way or not he referenced the gulf of mexico and in the gulf of mexico one of the theories about the gulf of mexico not science fact is that a giant asteroid smacked into it and made a, a huge crater and so you ended up with like islands in florida and this nice neat little uh little crater so i thought i thought that's an awesome idea i thought that's an awesome idea maybe a giant meteor smacked into it and the story is so old that now the legend is that the islands fell in. Okay, Although I, yeah, I, I, I there are tons of scientific so. questions I could raise about that, like just the debris fallout from a meteoric impact that big or asteroid impact that big. But but we don't need to address the, the science questions because magic. Okay, so, so <laughs> okay, this is another thing. It happened long ago before there was inhabitants there, obviously, because they would have been obliterated. Yes. It's just the story is that the the mountains fell into the sea. Do you know, like myths that don't make mm. sense? That is what is this is. It's not science. Yes. It's their version of science fiction of how the mount how the islands became. Hey, it's a it's a happened. legend. It's folklore. Yeah. And and that that's totally cool. That's totally cool. I'm, so I'm glad. <laughs> I'm glad you approve. As you can see, we had a heated debate. We should have just had the debate before when we got online about it because I was like, but geology. And you were like, but it's D and D. <laughs> so yeah. So um oh and uh James Leslie is saying that your volume's a little low if you want to turn yourself up just Okay. A bit. That makes sense because I've moved my mic without checking the sound. So just let me know uh, when it's too crazy. Okay. Um, so let's see the, here. So is this loud enough now? And we'll just go on. Uh, we'll so, just go on. Um, so I say meteor hit is what really truthfully happened. S smash the area. That's why there's a certain level that the sea goes down to. So it's maybe like 40, 50, 60 feet. And it's filled in. But there's some high peaks that happened from the impact explosion that have these kind of like what look kind of like at some points mountains peeking out of the of the of the water. Mm. Yeah. OK, so y y the goal here, the end product here is uh, that we have a nice, clean half moon. And you said it's three islands. Uh, uh, three major city states. Three major but city there's states. There's going to be more islands, smaller islands, but the major okay. ones are controlled and occupied. 
Now, I could also say that one of the city-states could be H Island Chain itself. Mm-hmm. So I'm I'm up to kind of figuring it out. I don't I have not sat here and said, well, I've I'm gonna play in this game next week and we're doing the island chain thing, so let's just have it all figured <laughs> out. I don't have any of it set in stone. I'm open to change my mind on almost everything except that there is actually a C and there are three city states. Okay. And the pirating that mainly goes on is the old school real pirating of different merchant companies secretly trying to screw each other over or city states doing kind of like duplicitous things. So same thing that goes on the land, they but they all say we're friends. We're friends. So the same thing with the other city states that happens with thieves guilds messing with each other or trying to buy out contracts of different companies through different things. So all that stuff goes on. But and it's basically warfare, but it's warfare without sending soldiers basically is what is what it is so it's economic kind of attacks similar but in in the sea it's actual legit economic attacks because attacks because they're using pirates for some things so all form of skullduggery and and economic intrigue and back dealing uh so when we when we dig into the kind of kind of piracy we're talking about here there is a few different things. There's crazy dudes on boats that murder everybody, Hollywood pirates. There is uh, legitimately hired, like they literally, they give you a writ that says it's legal for you. A few people mentioned privateering. Yeah, that's privateering, right? Yeah, they give you a writ that says it's legal for you to be out here. You can take anything you want from ships. The major thing about privateering was that parcels that you would take from ships would stay sealed because nobody will buy the stuff that you've opened. Um, and that was that was kind of a thing with privateering. It was also a thing with pirating. And then there is straight up murk. Like these guys are our military vessel and we paid them and this military vessel is gonna go, go do work for us, like a defunct military unit or something like that that took their ship. So there's, there's a couple different directions we can go here, but we can assume just everything is taking place at this point. We've got, privateers and crazy pirates and uh, random military vessels going around and all kinds of stuff. Yes. Um, all of that is happening all at once. Okay. I don't, I, don't, I don't even have the nations named. The the city-states? Ah, okay. So, so, so we, are, we are extremely open to influence tonight, guys. So yeah. you, you're, you're probably going to get to Put your little fingers in the soup, so to speak. Uh, Russet Man said, uh, uh, something I'm curious about is some of the specifics of the city states. And that's one of the things that we need to, we're going to get all of this stuff sorted out tonight. Uh, and then you just, it, Russet Man goes into some variables. Is one particularly religious? Does one have a good relationship with the pirates? Um, I, the way it's sounding to me, it sounds like everybody is openly dealing with groups to infringe on other people's trade but not openly <laughs> yes they're all saying we should get the pirates <laughs> yeah exactly but they're Let's... all hiring the pirates okay okay I mean, the privateers so so this this comes up with another another concept for us here if everyone is willingly acting willingly working with these pirates then there must be some form of unified military seafaring faction that is doing really well for itself. They're selling sealed packages. They're selling people, probably. I, pirates weren't nice people, so that's not beyond them. They're, you know what I mean? So is there uh, somewhere in the island chain that maybe would be the the unfindable headquarters and all the city states know where it is but somehow the military ships just never go near it well i think it's going to have to actually be kind of out to sea out in it more towards the ocean so i would okay. say it's not part of the actual circuit okay of islands, okay the chain of islands what do you think I, well, I like the idea of uh, some distant thing, and this is Dungeons and Dragons, so I don't see any reason to not do a water world thing. 
it's very rare when you can have a, a situation where a group of individuals live almost entirely off raiding. But this is a very special group of individuals with a very special group of circumstances. They could have a massive flotilla out in the, the, the ocean somewhere that is literally their kingdom. You know, like 10 square acres of boats that are all right next to each other. And it could be this crazy evil pirate city thing. Okay, it's, so... you know, parts of it are always sinking and there's, you know, they, they trade Ill illicit wares there. Um, and maybe this is where, you know, you'd see the, the pomp, the pomp proper noble going to the pirate bay in order to have words with them about the last mission they mucked up, you know, and he's all uncomfortable and there's a saloon and, you know, parlor girls and all kinds of stuff he just does not want to deal with. So, okay. So let's say there's the three city states, mm -hmm. one of which I want to be uh island shape uh, like a, a series of islands okay uh, uh generally on twitch jan said earliest pirates were actually privateers that were first paid to show up in the area and disrupt merchant travel um merchant travel of the competition but once their hirers refused to pay them it resulted in privateers becoming yeah, they're like, right. oh, we can't pay you because then we're attached to you or something. But thanks for doing that job for us. And like, yeah, right. exactly. Well, if you're going to skimp on your pay, we'll just start attacking your stuff. You know you did tell us where all your ships go too, right? Like, <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, don't attack these five or six ships that are all hanging out over at XYZ. These are ours. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, there is a crazy conversation going in chat. Okay, so let me see if I get the gist of this. You guys are talking about a sleeping, the meteor woke a sleeping Tarrasque. Uh, start at like the Godzilla? First... Yeah, exactly. Uh, well, James Leslie asks, uh, so why not start at the first? How many islands are we looking at? And where are the locations of the three city states? Um, so I think we're slowly just kind of pawing our way into this. This is real, like, primordial stuff at this point. Yeah. We have a shape. We have a number of islands. I think what we've got concretely is there's number one and two are both major islands. Mm -hmm. um, number three is a series of islands. And the fourth unofficial island city-state is Barge Island. I like mm -hmm. the idea of it being, it's technically mobile. <laughs> mm-hmm. But it is just a series of connected uh, flotilla things. Exactly, exactly. So we've got the the home of the evil slash mercenary. Like you could definitely have a neutral good character come out of that place. Like he's not a bad guy, and he's just working for whoever pays him to be a soldier. Lots yeah, of so they're basically soldiers on the water at that point, and every other right. nation, every other merchant that they're against is just the enemy combatants exactly exactly what's up buddy uh so there's there's uh our three city states that make extensive use of the baddies that live in in barge island their flotilla island <laughs> sorry so kyle ellis <laughs> coral reef city oral rig for tinker nobs crack and pretending to be an island so it can eat a ship every few months since it's lazy <laughs> see i i like the idea of bringing like huge amounts of craziness into this and i i think i think there has to be a reason because what we're dealing with here and chat you guys can completely countermand me on this but i feel like there's this massive area and what was the what was the name of the the primary mainland area the merchant That's the merchant circle road Right. So the Merchant Circle Road, and I assume these guys are like the Merchant Circle Road. These guys are a big military power. Yes, they're the power in the region. Okay. they And they have primary trade access with the islands and stuff. It's kind of like merchant princes with their own city-states. Okay. Okay. Elector counts, if you will. <laughs> I'm not familiar with elector counts, but... Uh, elector, cool. elector counts are Warhammer fantasy. They're just... Everybody's supposed to vote for an emperor. They never vote for the same person. But anyway, okay. these, are, these are people who lead different countries in this place called the empire. So 
And I, li- I like the idea of... Um, I was talking with uh, Kaneda off-air about Magic Coral. <laughs> and I think if one of the nations had an extensive coral reef and that was kind of their defense as well as what they harvested, I think hmm. that would be cool. So a coral reef that's literally a physical barrier to ships coming in? Yeah, you have to basically traverse like, a certain certain pathway. It's like almost like labyrinth. Okay, okay. So this this does raise some cool concepts up. So if you had... Uh, one of the city states say a massive island and they just had all of these areas out in the water where there's just it's just opulent here just life everywhere lush coral reefs as uh, reef as far as the eye can see in just every direction but the people who are used to applying these waters know the route in and out i like this all right yeah so we got the coral reef labyrinth, and I cannot remember spell how to spell labyrinth right now. <laughs> but whatever, someone someone will let me know. Use mm-hmm. the Googles that I can't do right now. Yes, because it's hating me. All right, so number two. Um, well, we got the series of islands for number three, and number two, I would like there to be some kind of. Um, I like that they all kind of have their major th- output commodity that they've got that they trade with everybody else with for. So I think the series of islands are going to be heavy into like fish and stuff. Ooh, I've got a really, really good one. So uh, Coral Reef, uh, the people who have the Coral Reef, Kyle Ellis says purple dye was only for nobles since it came from a sea urchin and cost almost 40 times the weight of gold. Wow. I think that is a super legit thing those guys in that island with the coral reef around them could center up on really exclusive resources like that. And because they're so well protected, it would be very hard to, to uh, infringe on their ability to make that trade. Um, So we're going to say purple dye and other reef rarities. Hmm. Reef rarities. rarities. So I'm going to say that the second island is kind of like tar sands and other things. Okay. And their export is uh, alchemical, uh, like petrol stuff. Duff. <laughs> petrol. Petrol. Okay. All right. That you can um, do all kinds of stuff in, including light fires and uh, lubricate gears and stuff. So I'm going to say that there's a lot of industry there. So they're going to have to like intake certain things because of, you know, it's kind of a nasty place. Yes. So maybe their island is so despoiled because of the kinds of things they do there. You could do like the extreme medieval industrialization thing Mm -hmm. where like this island, it does have strong exports and that's why people tolerate it. But it is somewhat nefarious, like uh, kind of a. Uh, um, house Arrakis kind of thing where they treat the population like garbage, they employ slaves, only the nobility live well, and then the island is so despoiled that maybe they bring in all of their food and other necessary resources from the outside uh, because their island is is trashed between mining and digging up and refining tar sands and everything else. It's just a blackened mess. Um uh condor dm ideas sea serpent and an unclaimed island mostly wildlife with some secret it could be fun to do something like that yeah we could definitely include we can definitely include that i like that uh so let's say uh, other islands other Hmm. island features there we go so we've got like a wild (laughs) <laughs> Wild Monster Island. That sounds good. That's one of them. That sounds good. Uh, lots of other interesting ideas. Uh, Kyle Ellis says one island could survive off of ancient ruins they raid for treasure. Uh, he also said pearl, squid ink, urchin dye, things like that. All of those things could be valuable. Uh, GGSL, the God of Wards, said, I feel like it almost has a steampunk feel to it. I assume you're referring to the industrialized island. And 
it wouldn't necessarily technologically need to go as far as steampunk in order to just be a filthy mess. Yes. Uh, <laughs> there's tons of instances of medieval era or iron or even bronze age. Uh, <clears throat> Trash bits. Of yeah. In, yeah. Industrial practices that destroyed things. Uh, so. But let's put some ancient ruins there as well. I think that's a good place mm -hmm. for that. Maybe there's um somewhere there's a gate that just keeps letting out this gunk, and that's why the island's been despoiled. But people are like, "This gunk's great. You can use it for all kinds of stuff." <laughs> so they so they build a place there, and some people live there. Not very in very good health, but they're making money. Mm. And of course, if the nobility is constantly uh, is the, are the ones in charge, and they would be, and they'd be making tons of money so they could afford a good army if they are constantly bringing in uh, captives from the pirate raids and stuff. And then you could have kind of that that uh, uncomfortable alliance where the pirates show up and sell people to them, uh, but they they just claim even, like literally pirate ships sitting in the bay selling its wares, and the king standing there watching it will tell someone next to him, no, no, we never deal with pirates. You know, like that, that we, of course yeah. not. Why would I associate with them? As they're walking through the market with some kind of diplomat or something like that, he's yeah. like, and we never associate with those filthy pirates. And like guys are in the background, like covering up crates that they're moving. <laughs> exactly. exactly. <laughs> he, like, won't even, he won't even everybody say. Know. <laughs> everybody knows Phil. Just tell them, no, 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 no. It's the illusion. Um, so we've got uh, Russet Mance and uh, Twitch saying another island could have a really active volcano. Oh, of course. And uh, Kenny94550 says whaling shark fins, pirating, building a cove for trapping and building boats, which they then plunder as ship graveyards. Mm, yeah. And Russet Man also says he likes the idea of a floating island in the air and detached from the seafloor. So, so. Oh, in the air or detached from the sea floor. So something that is buoyant enough and has been basically removed from its base so it, it slides around like either really maybe it's That's... maybe it's the roots of a tree and it's like a tangled nest of these roots that have just built up and built up and built up. Almost like a, mm. almost like a sea tree. You know how you know how like well you know how like seaweed it's got those little bubbles. You know you can have it where it will float. So kelp because it has yeah kelp has um like they make those little gas bubbles in them. Yeah, it makes it it makes an air pocket in it. So kelp when it grows in the ocean, guys, kelp will have uh it'll it'll have a root base and then it'll basically develop air pockets pockets in it so it stands vertically. Uh, makes it really easy to farm. Good source of food. And it makes uh, it really easy to get sunlight. So mm -hmm. a plant that has that ability to float would be really handy. So I think that would be a really hot place to put uh, the sea elves. Cause the seafaring elves. I feel like i got to have sea elves if I'm going to have ocean stuff. My my elves in the legend were born from sea foam like Aphrodite. And oh, they just cool. they just always live on the coast and prefer to be at sea. So... I definitely like the idea of sea elves. Now I'm uh, I'm fine with these not being like necessary PC race elves. I'm I'm talking more like they could be dryad, more like fey like like dryads. Maybe they're actually born in the like bubble pockets. Mm, yes, yes. Yeah, let's this go with that. Good. Yes, winner. I want them to have gills now. Winner. <laughs> this is good. Uh, Jan brings up a really important point, something that would definitely need to be addressed. Uh, Jan said drinkable water that is not magically created would be a highly traded commodity. And that's true mostly for islands with larger populations. Fresh water is going to be quite the conundrum. It's going to be a toughie to come up with. Um, that could be a commodity for that place that has all that uh, alchemical fuel stuff because Maybe they, they, could, have a... they could make giant kettles. They could s export salt to the... The mainland? The mainlands, and they could also uh, export water to the surrounding islands. That is really interesting. The filthiest island is the source of fresh drinking water. So where you get the clean stuff from. 
dude, now I imagine crazy industrial looking black smoke billowing ships going along and it looks really intimidating, but it's just a water tanker. It's just full of clean drinking water. They're taking it to another island. I yeah, like, it's like it. Covered in, it's like this giant like ca uh, canister yeah. covered in grime, but like inside is like fresh water. <laughs> That's I think that's really cool. I think that's a cool angle to hit. Essentially, like the desalinization plants, which is basically what we're talking about yeah. here, desalinization plants on the mainland, and then yeah, distilleries essentially that are there. They pump out clean water for everyone else. <laughs> uh, a mangrove dinosaur island with tombs and raw arcane energy. Um. Kyle Ellis says, uh, the island that figures out how to separate salt from water has salt and water. Exactly, Kyle. Yeah. Exactly. So I like the idea of that. I like the idea of sea elves. Maybe the sea elves are like, we, we don't care. We just want the pirates to leave us alone. And this is our <laughs> chunk of ocean, so yeah. go away. Now, I kind of want them to be in the, the middle, the calm sea area. So that's mm, kind okay. of their domain. So they can mm. have like a couple floating around kind of islands i like this idea yeah now is this the kind of thing where essentially they're always kind of rebuilding the island like uh like it, it kind of elicits thoughts of like you see a sea lion he's hanging out next to an iceberg in the water and he hops up there and he just chills there maybe they you know he has to go to land to mate or something like that but that's just where he goes to hang out and doesn't have to be on his guard. Maybe the sea elves are doing something similar with these islands. Yeah. I like think huts, would, tribal society. I think it would be like, like, yeah. Island, I like Islanders, like the old school. Mm -hmm. If you, if you, you have a very specific diet based on the things that are available to you, you don't travel very mm -hmm. far, except maybe to travel into the sea or another Island to gather resources. So, and I'm saying fey dryads because I kind of want them to be different. I don't just want to try and take an elf from player's handbook and make it more sea-like. I'd rather it be a creature almost closer to Triton. I, hey, it could be reskinned Tritons, for all I know. Mm, it it could works. just be a Triton that um, is more, like, woodsy because, it's, Mark, it, because it has that, like, mangrove forest, like, feel to it. Mark Christensen totally busted me. He said, reminds me of smokers from Waterworld. Yeah, pretty much. That's that's where the goal of that was. <laughs> <laughs> you got me. You got me. I was kind of, I'm just feeling that like Waterworld vibe for some of this stuff. So, um, well, it's a good, it's a nice thing to draw from because of how, how much water was there and that we're dealing with the water area. And tons and tons of suggestions. You guys are really doing awesome pouring in the suggestions. I, we appreciate that. Um, floaters Lincoln nailed it I like that uh, Lincoln uh, says sea elves living in on the kelp aka floaters and it would be the kind of name where the elves really didn't have a name or maybe had their own elven name for it but all of the human civil populations that live in this area they just call them floaters and so now you could now you could use that as the common name. Maybe the, it's so common that even the elves call them floaters at this point. Because they don't really consider them elves. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. So they're more like plant people. So these plant, plant? people. <laughs> now they're okay. All right, go. Bye. All right, I'm ready. So these plant people, the floaters. Uh, yes. Maybe there's some. There definitely be some legend and lore about finding like uh like a handsome man or a beautiful woman in like this pod and that they're like magical people and all this kind of stuff that mm, like maybe. as a as a as a pirate or, i mean as like a seafaring world it's like basically like finding someone stranded at the sea and they're like mystical in some way which these people actually are because they're kind of magical have you ever seen a shark egg yes that's what I was thinking. The pod? Just like a the seaweed shark? kind of thing instead. Yo, yeah, that's it. That's it. Nailed it. All right, that's what we should go with. That sounds excellent. Um, Emiliano Garcia said, trade with the underwater folk is a good idea. People far more advanced to provide unusual material. And I tend to agree with him. They're going to be able to get their hands on stuff, especially if they can breathe underwater. 
the yep. stuff they can dredge up. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, and they'll have lot. They wouldn't necessarily like. Maybe they don't place any value on gold. It's heavy. Somebody it's hard to deal do with. Something terrible. Like enslave a group of them and make them divers. <sighs> oh, absolutely. Some rotten, rotten fella somewhere. Maybe our our smokers, our industrial clean water providers. Now let's not make them the evil people of everything. Let's just ah! make, they only screw up the. I mean the the pod people, the the shark egg like seaweed pod people, uh, floaters are not that excited about what they do. But let's not make them the most terrible people ever of the island. <laughs> <laughs> it's like oh, who is the evil city state? Those guys. Mm. Emiliano Garcia just just hit us with uh, sometimes when you find a shark egg washed up on the beach, it is referred to as a mermaid's purse. Yep, exactly. Um, Kyle Ellis says we could put a small population of tritons in uh, so you have kind of a wandering aquatic paladin order, which is kind of a neat idea. That's um, cool. Uh, I think they're going to be further out. Okay, so you've got the interior, which is the Commerce Sea. It's almost uniform in depth until you get to where the like crater, like deep down, is, mm. or possible spaceship that has crashed yeah. into. <laughs> <laughs> hey, if I can cram a terrible alien monster into a D and D game, I'm really. It's really hard to not. It's really hard to resist that. Hmm. Yeah. So the Tritons would be on the, let's say, exterior sea, which is heading towards the, like, large ocean area. Okay. Okay. So we can say, Ellis like, the interior and exterior, so. Kyle Ellis brings up a, uh, a good point. We need at least one storm giant. Storm I, I feel giant. like, yeah, we might be getting into the, unless he plays some role in the, in the world, the immediate world, we might be getting into... Like when you run it, you put the storm giant in territory. Oh, he he could he could play a role in the world. Storm giants can be very influential when they start throwing things at people. Well, so well, the mountains <laughs> do go all the way to the sea and end mm -hmm. by just like dropping off into a giant cliff area. So mm. there could be basically like a cliffside on the edge giants there. They don't necessarily mm -hmm. need to be storm giants, though. Mm, storm giant or mm, storm giant's the best fit, though. Come on. That's, I mean, that's fine. I wasn't. I wasn't saying it could be how, anything. I'm how much money could. is that storm giant gonna bring in? Like resource? He never needs to leave the house. He can be like, "Do you want it to be a sunny day, or would you prefer like a hurricane?" Because I can, Ooh. I can whip one up. <laughs> oh, that'd be, be interesting. So we're gonna say. On the mainland, so mainland, but still within the interior sea area, we'll have the storm giants. Mmm, God, Lincoln, awesome dude. Lincoln says biological diving bells for traders or guests. Speaking of the huge pockets of the kelp stuff that the elven people have. Yeah, I can see them. That's like their houses could be underwater, like domes in a way. It could be a bubble. I mean, yeah. you know what I mean? Like completely cylindrical. Well, yeah, uh, there'd be certain areas because there's certain areas where it gets thin and you can kind of see through it and it's translucent, but it's still. And then there would be like stronger, almost like a stretchy leaf. You know how like there's going to be yeah. some translucent and then there's the veins, which actually give it the, the structure and integ structural integrity. Yeah. And then and then divers getting to use those. I mean, they definitely go out and be like, yeah, we need our, our other three rotted or became desiccated or whatever. Can we buy some more of those? And they'd be like, it's weird that you want to buy these houses that we grow with little effort. But sure, yeah, we'll so take a bunch of stuff. The, I don't so, know what... so the pod people are uh, suppliers of diving bills. Yeah, why not? Why not? That's awesome. Imagine being a player on a boat and watching them lower that thing into the water off the side. What are they doing it just again? Looks like a giant like seaweed bubble. Thing. <laughs> the GM's like, "This is a picture. Do you do you get it?" Now? <laughs> do you get it? Now? <laughs> yeah. No, I totally like that. Um, 
Uh, Russet Man says now something else to touch on would be uh, things like superstitions of the sailors, beliefs in this area is kind of where my brain goes with a, a statement like that. Uh, so we have a basic concept of kind of who lives where. Uh, and what do we have here for... Oh, we're not even on that page anymore. But we have uh, three islands so far, or do we have elves, one island, the super evil island, even though he doesn't want it to be super evil? Give me time, guys. And then the, <laughs> the, the pirate flotilla sitting out there. All right. So we've got what, the Coral Reef Labyrinth Island, the Tar Sands Island, and then the island kind of like... <sighs> Well, now, oh, oh, green, we're back. <laughs> Yay! Sorry, folks. One, one day. One, one day. day. I don't know. Sometimes yeah. it's just the, it, the internet dies. Okay, we can't be sure where it died there, so why don't we go, why don't we do a complete review of what we had it one more time. Okay, so we've got the Coral Reef Labyrinth City-State. Got the Tar Sand City-State. Got the Series of Islands City-State. And then we have the pirates, and then we have the floaters, which are like the fey dryads that float on a detached floating tree roots. Mm -hmm. Also known as the shark egg like seaweed pod people. <laughs> awesome. And they're going to be the suppliers of interesting sea equipment that is organic in nature. I like the idea of having diving bells, maybe some kind of you know, like you breathe through a tube and it like there's this floaty thing up top. So if you're like diving like 30 feet underneath, there's this like bobbing sea, mm, sea lettuce or something that you can breathe sea, through. Sea lettuce, just a head of lettuce. In your... a, a, a empty head of lettuce. <laughs> just empty. Sorry about that, guys. It has been it has been nightmare fuel tonight. It, it just does not want to cooperate. So we are we really are trying to do the best we can to keep the stream running. The stream's uh, going down now, right? We're good. Yeah, looks good. Looks it's happening. Good. Um, so... Oh, sirens. Yeah. There's no siren in 5th edition? Uh, I there, don't know. There is a siren. There is a siren? Oh, yeah. Clearly, we would want to put the sirens in somewhere. The question would be, are the elves friends with them? Or do they hate them? Hmm. Hmm. Fuse merfolk in sea hag. That's an interesting idea, Kyle. Okay, so uh, we've got the basic concepts for the islands. We've got the uh, pirate ship flotilla. Uh, we've got the um, smoker island. Uh, Who what are we do? Who that's aren't just, that evil? That's the environment. Yet, and we have. <laughs> And we have the, the island chain, the group of smaller islands. So what exactly are we doing with this group of smaller islands? Well, I would think that they're going to have a lot of access to fishing. And I figure that there's going to be a lot of... It's almost going to be one of those places that you could just stick another island and no one will notice. So, like, add your own little adventure thing is what I want to say to it. So that's where you're going to find... You know, maybe an island that has a specific thing on it. Maybe there's an island that has like the like a tribal goblins or something. You know, I'm okay. So we're just gonna leave these open, and we could say a number of small islands, and we don't really have to say how many. Yes, that's what I would like to leave it as, especially okay. for right now, because I'm not going there anytime soon. Okay. So okay. it's like, yeah, here's a whole bunch of islands. Uh, there's at least 10. Well, first rule in world building, don't forget big open spaces. People like to yes. explore. Uh, so I definitely like the idea of saying this group of smaller islands is a group of smaller islands. Have fun, game masters. Tear it up. So that seems that seems like a perfect thing to do with yeah, that. I mean, if you want to put the Toma Horrors in there, you can just stick <laughs> it right in there. Yeah. That might take a shoehorn. Yeah. Um, you want to put some some adventure because there's, I don't know, a temple to some kind of dragon god there. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Have fun. That's perfect. 
that's perfect so next we're going to move on to fleshing out what these different groups are like we've got general concepts but we don't have i like the i like the idea on the smoker island well i think that's got the most energy behind it so let's go for that (laughs) it does because of the tar sands yeah um so if we're working on the smoker island i really like the idea smoker island (laughs) uh okay so uh on smoker island uh i definitely enjoy the idea of saying the wealthy powerful families that are in control are the only people that are really enjoying their stay okay because they can afford to build on top of all the gunk and ugliness of the place right and they are going to the people the primary people who have easy access to affordable clean drinking water all the time Um, they're going to have easy access to imports like exotic foods and things like that. And the big thing in this case is trade comes in with food. It's getting funneled through these wealthy families before it ever gets dispersed or before anybody else gets a swing at it. Uh, so the general populace is going to be in pretty miserable living conditions. If the wealthy people are just filling their bellies before they, they leave table scraps to anyone else. Yeah. So let's say there's four families. Four fam, four primary families. Yeah. Um, the salt and water. Okay. Is the one. And we have a, a real opportunity to do like a Game of Thrones, Menzo Baranzan, families murdering each other, things are real dark kind of thing. It here. could be like that if you're trying to make this the obvious evil island. What? Well, I'm not. Tomato. It's not. <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> You... I'm watching you. Yeah, <laughs> uh, it's it's. I think. Uh, what are the seasons like around these islands? Asked James Leslie. That is an interesting question. Uh, they're what, rather what nice. Are... They're definitely far enough away. You figure you've got the entire merchant circle, which is several hundred miles across. Hmm. And even at the top of that, you're still not at Credra's Belt, which is the cold place in our world. Mm -hmm. So you're still in the kind of temperate, I guess if you're familiar with, well, I'm familiar with the East Coast of the United States. So if if I'm going with the East Coast of the United States, I'm saying this is like New York, um, the countryside of New York to like Georgia, like that kind of temperature zone from from where the, the storm giant lives all the way down to like the Tar Island. So the Tar Island's heading more towards not trop- quite tropical, but like nice, nice, decent weather most of the year. Okay. All right. Okay. And then uh, you've got up towards the storm giant, you're going to have more like it does actually, well, aside from it being in the mountainous area, it's going to get cold, like super pretty cold during the winter, especially because it's a mountain peak. And um, I would say the, uh, what's an island chain that's in, around that area? Around what area? Like the temperate, the kind of like the temperate zone. There are some lower islands, uh, like below Alaska, that are maybe I don't have a globe in front of me, but they might be close to lined up with or right above the upper the upper east coast of the U.S. Okay, so let's uh, just say it's one. You've got the tropics. You've got the like. Uh, caribbean style place you've got florida like temperature wise where it's like 85 in the past week while it's like cold here it was snowing this morning oh Uh, yeah a lot of snow so in the winter you've got the places that are even you know warm in the winter uh, but that is kind of below the curve okay the island so we're talking solidly temperate they still have winter they still have winter the the, the upper ones definitely have more than the normal because the islands that are going to be cool they'll be you know cooled by the sea but also warmed by the sea when it's freezing elsewhere up top so mm, okay so let's All say right. temperate islands temperate to like closer to tropic but not so they still, have, they still have a winter okay okay but it's All not right. like the great lakes where everything can freeze over and be nasty and terrible mm. 
Uh, the God of Ward said uh, the ruling houses have a part of this beast and their crest has something to do with the beast and they're fighting for control to be head to find and control this beast. What beast? Waker of the and, Beast, Krakens? Hmm. Godzilla? Hmm. I mean, Tarask <laughs> of the Sea? Tar yeah, exactly. Uh, like Monsoon? Monsoons would be monsoons would be legit. You would still end up with a lot of the weather conditions depending on the scale of the islands. Much larger islands, it all it also depends on how the currents move. And we have Kredge first belt, so it would take. I need to sit down and draw out where water would move. I I can't yeah. even. <laughs> I hate to burst your bubble. We're we are far away from drawing the. Um the conveyor chains of water underneath yeah. the sea. That's not happening right now. It would take me a lot of time to draw that out. Yeah. Um, Considering this is an amorphous area of the same continent that Griffin Gaff is on. Mm. But Griffin Gaff okay. is like mm, 1,500 to 2,000 miles away to, is the, to the west of the Merchant Circle. So we're talking okay. about quite a long travel or a nice boat ride. Jan always has all the fun info. Uh, Jan on Twitch said, there's an island chain in the middle of the Atlantic called Porta Delgada, uh, same longitude of New York. So it would line up quite nicely. Mm. Uh, they are west of Spain. So now if we want to try and get some very accurate uh, images of what the weather looks like, we could just reference that. Okay. Which is something I do constantly when I'm world building, which is reference real world locations, real world, world societies, and historical precedent for how I think things might have played out somewhere. So. Yeah, it adds a nice level of realism to your game without you having to be like a scholar of. You can't know everything. Yeah, you can't be a climatologist, a really great role player, a botanist, and all these other things together. <laughs> Just like look it up and go, like, okay, I'll. I'll snitch this, I'll snitch this, I'll take that. Yeah, thank you. Exactly, exactly. When world building, your best friend is not some piece of software for world building, it's Google. <laughs> yes. Use Google. <laughs> so we got these four families. We got salt and water, alchemical oils, brewery, and extracts. Mm. And do we have somebody from these families trading, maybe not so nicely trading with the floaters? Mm. Do we want well, to do that? Do you, would you like that little slice of gray? I Well, I here's the thing. I need to know what angle you want to take on it. Because if there, is it open trade? Like we show up and we trade with you because we need something from you and you need something from us? Or is it we go by in the equivalent of whaling boats, capture a bunch of you and have free divers now? Like, like what? what angle are we taking with it? They could literally go raid the floaters and the other islands are like, hey, dude, that's messed up and evil. Don't do that. And they're like, meh, no law against it. We're going to go back and do it again. I don't know. I think I want to steal. I kind of want to leave that to scummy pirates. Like that there is a slave trade mm -hmm. or an inde indentured servitude. Indentured servitude. And maybe... You tr like it could be said that if you trade someone something that's of such a value that they can't pay it back with their wealth, then they have to pay it back with their labor. Oh yeah, debtors' prisons. That could that is... be just the sly way that they figure out how to do that. Absolutely, absolutely. I really, really like the idea of bringing something like that in. Okay, I so like... we will have a, a super scummy element. There's the <laughs> <clears throat> the um the seafarer supply okay suppliers um which supply all kinds of things uh debt tour labor mm. uh, diving bills uh, James Leslie brings up an important point. Uh, he says if they're that industrious uh, speaking about the smokers, uh, they would probably build their own. Uh, uh, industry, I assume, uh, that would damage the area that the floaters are living in. So they, they are causing some level of pollution, even though they are cranking out their own clean water, maybe they are causing some level of destructive, 
ecological activity and the floaters are like we absolutely hate those scumbags they are wrecking this place yeah. and that would generate a lot of tension with the guys next door who have a, a huge coral reef that protects them like, <laughs> like i can see them being upset about that hey um we need this and you're killing it like lightning fast can we talk <laughs> Maybe they've erected some kind of seawall where they've just built giant sandbars to redirect mm. the flow of the funk. Out to the ocean? Either out to the ocean or in towards the floaters, and that's what's that's what's kind of messed up. Here, here comes Godzilla. He can smell that. Where's <laughs> like, the pollution? <laughs> I think it's Delicious. time to make an environmental movie. Uh, I'm thinking of fish that keep their kids in their mouth. Uh, if you are thinking of fish that keep their brood of young in their mouth, those are cichlids. Uh, and there are a couple different breeds of cichlids that do that, but there are a bunch in the, it's in Africa, and it's that very specific volcanic area that I can't remember the name of right now. I'm lost. But anyway, yeah, cichlids... Uh, which are like you can see cichlids in your pet store, Jack Dempsey's, a uh, bunch of other fish like that, but they keep all the young in their mouth. That's an interesting idea for a giant whale creature. Um, reef around the smoker. Okay, uh, Russet Man on Twitch says there used to be a reef around the smoker island, and there still is just a little bit of one just not that much of one anymore. So maybe it's not impacting the other island yet, but they definitely killed their own stuff off. Hmm. Maybe that's where the um, the sea zombies live. <laughs> sea zombies? We need sea zombies. It's just like when you go to space, there's got to be some kind of plant zombie monsters. <laughs> when you go to <laughs> sea in D&D, don't you have to fight zombies or skeletons or something? Hmm. I've always been a huge fan of undead pirate ships. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, clack and clack. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to say that these four families, which can remain nameless for right now, um, okay, hold the power in the region when it comes to that particular island. Uh, but anything that's not though, anything that's not on that list, is an incoming commodity. Because okay. aside from their, aside from their, um, what would you call that? It's not like hanging gardens. Uh, trellis. Yeah. So let's say they've got um, uh, giant trellises. Okay. Cool. Uh, trellis. Yeah. Whatever. Uh, giant. They they could have like hills and things like that. Those those are often made into step. Basically, Farms. they've built up an area where they can have their own good food, but the rest of the people have got to work. Like, anybody in the industries has to work for their food. Do you know what I mean? Like, there's not mm. really any other places to grow it because of how so, gross the industry is. Okay, okay. So if you want to eat, you're either getting an import, which would be expensive, or you're Bob the normal civilian and you work in the royal family's trellises in order to provide for your, your family. Yeah, so, so they've basically built up a region, an area in which they can grow their food. Okay. And, right. and basically, what is that? It's kind of like the different city levels. What was it? In Midgar or something like that in uh, Final Fantasy with the super soldiers. And there was like there was like the junk area where you are. And ah. there's like the higher tiers like plates okay. or whatever yeah no 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 i totally get that and that's that's a kind of a recurring theme in a lot of uh like uh, uh fiction is the idea that there's an undercity where normal people live uh yeah. and it's garbage and it's where the trash goes and it's highly polluted and then there's the upper tier of the city where the wealthier live and then the super rich maybe live above the clouds or uh, you know, live at the super, super top of uh, the mega city and Judge Dredd does it. Final Fantasy does it. There are a bunch of things that do it. So. Yeah. Well, it's like symbolic, symbolic, higher than you, as well as yeah. we have all the power and money. So we're higher than you. <laughs> exactly. I get to live here because I don't know. I was born. That guy's my dad. He has all the money. 
I mean, if you were ultra rich, would you want to have the chance that some garbage or some guy who's like totally Waste. poor and a slave is peeing on your head? You know, like <laughs> you don't want that to happen. Mm. Exactly. Axenar uh, says Necromunda was like that. Yeah, it was. It had uh, hive cities. Uh, and the hive city. See? I love this playing. This place is going to be good evil. <laughs> I loved playing the rat skins and the spire guys. The like super oh. suit guys. I liked the like, like crappy muskets and daggers and like wearing giant rat furs. And then the like super elites that come down just to kill people. I like doing that. They're both of those the teams were super fun. That I I those were I'm not gonna be able to remember this. No, there's no way. It started with a J or something for the guys that lived up in the spires and came down. But yeah, no, Necromunda was an awesome game. Yes. <laughs> Axonar said he was a spire player. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. Good times. Super suits. Mm. Oh, cool. Russet Man's uh, just throwing out a couple random ideas. He said uh, we could have kelp based plant monster, one of the uh, one of the numerous for reasons why you oh one of the numerous reasons uh, why you don't swim out too far from shore. Uh, and he said it could, you know, grab people with kelp. It could be like a roper. That what about just, like a sham like a shambling mound? Yeah. Well, yeah, roper, absolutely. roper would work too. Well, Maybe it could be different somebody. versions. They all kind of are the same thing, but they're just oh, this is a Roper variant, and this is oh yeah, but this is we can we could monster mash this location. Yes, that might be fun, especially things that came from living in the wasted area. We're gonna have to do the fluffy happy island, aren't we? Uh. I think the magic coral place is a great <laughs> unicorns and ponies and rainbows place. <laughs> They're like oh, the oh. guys that like the floaters the best, I think. Okay, okay. So we've got the Ifriti Smoker Island. Now let's have the... Um... Mm. Um... Yeah, James Leslie, uh, just pointing out something else about Necromunda, says they just relaunched Necromunda. Haven't tried the new one yet. I haven't. I heard had rumors any of that. Time. I was not going to say it in case it wasn't true. Yeah, I haven't had any time to look at any of that stuff. So. Um, there we go. Yeah, kelp trying to drown you over trying to hurt you. Yeah, absolutely. Easiest way to get your food is to make sure it's not moving when you're trying to eat it. Um. Okay, so we're going to swap over to the fluffy, the, the unicorn happy island? Yes. Okay, all right, sweet. Unicorn happy island. Magic all coral labyrinth. That shoots rainbows out. No. Well, um, on really clear days, when the sea is calm, it does look ooh, like a glowy rainbow underneath. You do bring up some interesting ideas. What, what are uh, available uh, spellcasting sources? that you could use to help ensure a coral reef's life. If it was being exposed to pollution. Well, plant growth, okay, so plant growth in general, you can use mm -hmm. it to grow plants really fast, or you can use it to increase the, the bounty of the area and mm -hmm. it doubles crops. It doubles the amount you can mm -hmm. get out of a, like, an, uh, like a mile square mile of land or something a certain mile radius of land is improved to the point where it's double pro double productivity so if you did that just like had a seat like a ceremony or a ritual that you that you had several of your druids or nature clerics do all mm -hmm. around the area they would that would i would say that would do it so what about we could still use a controlling cast for this island, but what if they're rooted in some form of a uh, druidic order or clerical order that follows a god of the seas or something like that? Let's make these our religious people. A religious people? Okay. Yeah, I kind of right. want it like a, like Templar or like a, what's that? Theocracy kind of place. Okay. Okay. 
this this gives us access to the ability to explain uh, that it, it, it maybe during uh, some there's like a, a story about a war in which one island invaded the other island and the fluffy bunny guys were like, you know what, you're trying to invade us. We're just going to bring up more coral reefs around the island uh, in order to stop you from moving in. Now, the bulk of the reason why a coral reef expands is because what's under, you know, a coral reef grows, then dies, and then something else grows, and then that dies, and something else grows, and you end up with these deposits, uh, uh, calcium deposits. It's yeah. calcium, right? I th uh, the polyps, I think they're, they when they die, their skeletons are uh, calcium right. in, in nature. Okay. So we wouldn't necessarily see them growing these massive new coral reefs, but they could keep their reef alive and continue to use it as a natural defense against attackers. And yeah, then if they, they worship... They might have even purposely grown it. Right. Over time, over generations. Um, well, with mm. magic, you can just grow it faster as well. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, uh, I uh, one of my characters grew a whole a whole spirit grove pretty quick. Mm -hmm. You know, when you're when you go up to like B seventeenth level, you can do a lot of stuff with uh with nature clerics. Now there are kind of two different perspectives I see being taken here. One is the kind of focal point leader, uh, where essentially we have uh, somebody who knows the higher level spells is. Uh, kind of revered as a avatar or representative of like the sea god or whatever they worship. And that's the person who does the bulk of the spell casting uh, and is 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 treated really well. So there's some there's some some uh, uh, precedent for maybe corruption, uh, even though I know you don't want there to be corruption or uh, a cast of higher level individuals. I just said we can't make the industrial <laughs> island the e most evil island ever that all the bad things happen at. They're perfectly, it's perf I'm perfectly fine with there being major flaws in all the islands. That's fine. It's just mm. like, ma you know, every system of government, there's people that fall through the cracks. And if you focus on those people that fall through the cracks, you can be like, this government is evil. Mm -hmm. and, but then some are more evil than others because they might kill millions of people. <laughs> Exactly. Uh, James Leslie says, so uh, they have druids tending to the food and uh, the coral in order to preserve it. I'd say so. So that, that's mm -hmm. what that's kind of what the religious, the religious, it could have just been a monastery at first that grew oh. into because of the attract, they were attracted to the things of the sea in the area. But then you had this situation where they had to defend that area from people who wanted to exploit the magic coral. And mm -hmm. so they, humans create orders to have basically, <clears throat> if they want to have their intentions travel through time, they create an order mm -hmm. that's going to handle their intentions throughout the centuries. And that, okay. you know, they can't stop it from twisting and turning and changing. But overall, a religious order that is interested in preservation of certain things that are nat nature based. Is going to have plenty of people that are like rangers, druids that really like that na natural aspect in on it as well. So they've got the basis of having the faithful in on it, and everybody's got benefits coming from the sea from the surrounding region. So they're they're interested in preserving that basically nest egg of resources, even if they just look at it like that, like self preservation wise. If I take care of this forest, the forest mm -hmm. will take care of me. So I don't want somebody chopping down all my trees. So similarly, they don't want people messing with this place more than harvesting lightly from it. So there's a, there's a bunch of different directions you could go with it at this point. If this druidic order is uh, is preserving the island, then are they also policing the use of resources? Because if you say, well, if purple dye is worth 40 times as much money as gold and everybody knows where to get purple dye from sea urchins are, is the Druid, Druidic order somehow coming in and saying, look, you can't, you can't just nuke all the, the sea urchins. I get you want money, but that's not going to work. They could be the wealthiest. Let's say this this way. They could be the wealthiest island city state, but they are not mm -hmm. because they don't ex they don't over exploit the the region do you know what i mean ah. 
I like that. Yes. So they could, they've got, they're sitting on enough natural capital that if they were to change it into money, they could, they could be one of the wealthiest city states in the merchant circle. Mm. But they don't, they don't do, that's not the way they see the, that's not the way they want to live for religious, uh, for, for religious reasons, for philosophical reasons. So I have some awesome suggestions here. Axnar does bring up a good point. I'm always, I'm constantly arguing science, but Axnar brings up a really good point. He says, if there's a plant growth spell, there could easily be a coral growth spell. Exactly. And why not have a variation of the spell? And so, I would just say that it pretty much does the same thing. Exactly. I know, I know corals aren't technically plants, right? <laughs> they are not. Let's go with that. We know, we know that. But right. they're close enough. <laughs> right. And it, there's, it's not far-fetched to say the Druidic Order came up with its own version be, yeah. to fit the circumstances you in which they... You cast it as a ritual that's been augmented. Bam, it does coral. Sure. It does algae. Um, it does X, Y, Z of the sea. Uh, James fishes bring... and stuff. Multiply. <laughs> and school of fish. Yeah. Um, James Leslie brings up an interesting idea. Uh, he says, uh, what if the coral reef is fed by the dead from the island? When some, someone passes, they float them out over the reef and sink them, and the coral feeds on them. Uh, just the kind of, well, just the idea that the coral reef could be seen as not just a potent resource in which balance needs to be maintained, but also as an ancestral site. Okay, so what do you think if they make... Okay, so they've got the coral growth stuff. They've got all that stuff. So they make a casket, basically, out of coral. You're still visible through it, but that's kind of like they send you off, and then they plant it to, like, grow more reef. What do you think about that? Because I think hmm. it would be kind of hard and kind of... It has an ickiness factor to just kind of, like, try and weigh someone down with stones. But if you could entrap them within some kind of cage, like natural well, cage, and then put them in. I'm a good person, right? And you're a druid of the order. And my family comes to you and says, Kaneda died, uh, and he was a good man, and we want him to have a proper death. And you say, okay, no problem. They load me up in my casket, and you, they float me out to sea, and you perform the rich the right of death and during the right of death any number of things could, could take place the waves could push it down into the coral reef the you could have a uh, sea or watery tendrils grab it and pull it down to where it's supposed to be i mean a small amount of spell casting and customizing the effects of magic in dnd really isn't really isn't that big a deal coral is basically like a like stone okay so the let's say part. you can meld them in to the reef. And Interesting. Then, and their their basically their resources is now going to be the resources of the reef. That's disgusting, but I like it. That's <laughs> that could be all cool. Like you know, you get stuck in you you know it opens up, you get stuck in there, and then the reef just kind of like lays its bony mm. fingers upon you. And and. I, I'm getting like seconds and thirds here. Uh, Axenar said the, the version of the petrification spell turns them into coral, uh, and then he gives a variation uh, flesh to coral. So oh, it would turn man. you into yeah, this petrification. Deposit. Yeah. Uh, Emiliano Garcia uh, said like a calcification. Um, and I agree, it is a really crazy, intense idea. Um, uh, Kyle Ellis said the coffins could be oyster or clam shells that the body is p placed in. It, interesting. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. They could, well, uh, based on, I guess, how decorate, decorated this person should be, maybe because either people, you, you, pay, you, you tip the druid enough, he's going to make you something nice. Oh, or, like Egyptian deaths. Or, or celebrate it by the community. Like everybody yeah. ga has gathered shells and conchs and cl you know, clam shells and oyster shells and everything like that from the, from the from just the sands around the area and have brought it together to celebrate someone's life. So rather than mm -hmm. flowers, you get basically parts of your coffin. Yeah. And they're going to be, you know, more decorative, maybe sea stars, maybe uh, urchins or something or. Mm. 
Hmm. Axenar's not done with us yet. He said, then, of course, there's the spell Coral Shape. Instead, <laughs> you could you could literally... I just imagine the druid sitting, uh, sitting in front of the body, kind of weaving together like... Uh, like the these tendrils of growing calcified looking material, like this white bony coffin, and then they or casing that goes around you, and then they float you out and you get pulled down. And of course, the better deaths would be maybe more idyllic or beautiful locations in the coral reef, perhaps based on where the rest of your family is gone when they died, or maybe based on like you were saying, tip the druid uh, in ancient Egypt. Uh, death was a huge financial investment. You put tons of money into scrolls with spells on them for when you died so that you would have them in the afterlife and all kinds of other effects. So it could be it could be really intricate, really interesting. I'd love to have a player die there. Now I just want my character to die at that island. Yeah, that would actually be a nice way to go is dying on the island yeah. and having that giant celebration happen. Yeah, that's where I want to die. Throw some shells on me, throw me in the coral reef. I'm super into that. Um, <laughs> Emiliano Garcia brings up the dark side of this. Coral walk sounds terrifying here. Yeah, but snorkeling, we don't do that here. It's it's a messed up sight. <laughs> oh God. Um. All right, I really like that. Uh, Russet Man asks, uh, how large would these crypts be? We might have specific spots that are used for the coral crypts. Uh, it'd be bad luck to sail through the waters of the coral crypts. Yeah, it'd be like walking on grave graves, basically. That's pretty hot. That's pretty hot. So that like that it. in and of itself, that actually does double duty because it becomes a protected area. Right. Where the exactly. locals refuse to mine for things. So it's almost like a wildlife reserve, in a sense, for the coral reef. Right. They won't go there to fish. They won't go there to get sea urchins or pearls or anything like that. They're not going anywhere near that area because that's where all the dead people went. Yeah, and it's not because, oh no, the dead people are alive. It's, um, you know, zombies, sea zombies. It's because it's like out of respect or just kind of like, I don't know, picking, <laughs> you pick flowers in graveyards, you know. Maybe mm. if you like to wear all black all the time. <laughs> you just, yeah. <laughs> All right, so now, uh, thanks to the coral reefs, we essentially have a druidic order yes. kind of running the show on this island, protecting the natural resources, uh, and being the spiritual guides for the bulk of the populace, I assume. And there, there were some other comments in YouTube chat that I that I missed. There was so much stuff going by. There was discussion about uh, the druid's ability to control waves or storms or any number of other magical. Effects. Yeah, exactly. Uh, a, a eighty foot wave goes after your sailing ship. You're not going to be in great shape. Yeah, done. So, all right. So, druid of the land and nature clerics, I would see as the like the highest level tier i would say of the society because it's based on theocracy so hmm. they're you know they're the ones that make sure all the uh all the stuff keeps happening for the area they're always improving the coral they're always improving the lands they're making everything more habitable better okay. and we're we're not going with super big overreaching direct corruption we're not saying that you know the lead druid's actually a lich or anything like that but it, no 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 oh, the coral magic coral labyrinth is actually a giant magic circle <laughs> but yes. what is what about you don't have to push the... me very far for a druid lich i'll jump off that cliff <laughs> druid liches. what what about the uh the lesser degrees of corruption because there's there's money circulating here. Oh, yeah. There's things that people want. Um, there's so going to there be a person that becomes a nature cleric or an acolyte mm -hmm. because it's good money. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But does that person ever become a nature cleric? I don't know because I'm going with you know <sighs> the gods don't walk the earth. 
the Ulf Ganya, but they are certainly obviously real. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So it's not like you're going to fake being a nature cleric. They have tangible influence. Yeah, they have tangible influence, and it's backed up because somebody allows them to have influence. Okay. Does that make sense? Okay. I mean, you'd have yeah, to be that's... pretty heinous. You could probably... You could probably become quite wealthy and still be okay, still be a nature cleric. Do you know what I mean with this trade? Yeah. Because you literally could just ask for more bounty in a sense. If you could grow <laughs> if you could grow coral every day just by doing an eight hour ritual, it'd be like, all right, forty hours of work and I'm gonna have a thousand more gold. <laughs> so so there would be from some precedent for corruption and uh maybe a dark underbelly here. Uh, if that's something a GM wanted to kind of bring in, whenever money is changing hands, things can go south. So, And you know, what if there's a nature cleric that maybe is never, has never been too powerful. He's always kind of like, he's kind of low in the hierarchy, let's say of the order. Mm-hmm. And he's got issues. Maybe there's stuff that comes up with his family that, well, let's just say that he's not very likable. Maybe the other people just socially are like, eh, yeah, it's that guy again. Let's, Let's go someplace else. And hmm. so he's got other reasons. Maybe he feels slighted. Maybe he feels in some way pushed aside when he feels he's just as deserving as some of the other clerics. And, you know, you get passed up for promotion enough in a religious order. It, start, it can start to get daunting if you if your mind turns towards those kinds of ideas. So you could easily have somebody become more corrupt that way. But I'm not. I'm not going to say like the high druid of the religious order or the the theocratic version of the king is like some kind of druid lich or something. Well, this this brings in a few ideas. Uh, it, first, what is the ruling party like? Is it led by the high the high druid, the high cleric, whatever? Or is it led by a king or royal family? Uh, And then there are several suggestions about uh, uh, extreme uh, uh, groups within the Druidic Druidic order and stuff like that. That's very much like games master territory, I feel like, as well as like the example you gave. Um, You could do whatever you want with the setting once you get your hands on it. All right. You know what? Okay. I'm fine with it. I am fine with there being a certain level of corruption. Here's... Here's why. Because when you have people that have power, it doesn't matter their the niceties around why they're doing something. They're pretty much like a whole bunch of uh, wealthy hippies, I guess you could say, the Druid Order. So you've got these guys in charge, so they're going to want, oh, well, my son, who there's going to be probably nepotism. I would say there's going to be buying favors. Mm. Like, oh, my son, I want him to marry into the noble house and be linked to them like maybe one of the nobles in the area so i'm going to offer that noble special benefits or special access to a resource that can make him money in exchange to elevate my family so now Mm. he's in the religious order and now his descendants are also they're like nobles and the religious order so like that could be something that they're interested in getting gaining influence over so and let's you, say, you're, huh? you're constantly going into the get into those exchange of power scenarios. Yeah. I so mean, we can say so for gaming. So I guess what's the the detail? What's the tension of the detail or the the tension in the area is where you can kind of get the dynamics of you know someone going too far and becoming a villain. So let's say that's one of the ways that could happen is um, through one of them. Ex, you know, basically exploiting something for for personal gain mm. and there, there this would not be the the first uh set of circumstances where you had a noble say my son or daughter is going to join the order yes and become one of your super powerful cleric people and the the clerics are like mm, i don't know if he works hard and then you know some greased palms and next thing you know he has no spell casting ability and is super high ranked yeah like that can happen <laughs> Yeah. Anybody who can cast resurrection has a huge amount of sway in any society. So <laughs> you just how it plays out. And you know what? 5,000 GP diamonds don't grow on trees. So the person who can supply yeah. those 5,000 GP diamonds gets a nice high seat in a religious yeah. order. 
Mm. So uh, Jam was talking about the uh, the use of like waves and water effects in order to damage other things. Uh, depending on the depth of the water is how high the wave has to be in order to affect the surface. Waves travel on the surface, but are just ripples until they get into shallow water. Yeah, so there is essentially if you have, let's say you have an earthquake in the ocean, earthquake takes place, causes a shock wave, a, a, a push. Uh, that push as it travels may look like a ripple on the surface, but the water's 60 feet deep. When it gets closer to land, you still have 60 foot wall coming at you, but now there's only four inches water on the ground. So it's just a giant wave. Yeah. Um, and that yeah. can start to kind of like impede its progress. Ruin your day. It would ruin my day. <laughs> well, hey, a 60 foot wave, I'm out. <laughs> if you're, if you're uh, 10 miles away from that 60 foot wave, it most likely is not gonna get you. <laughs> Hopefully, hopefully, your unless you have like salt flats or something. Mm -hmm. And so, what was I going to say with this? Another thing with the the naturey area. Oh, mm -hmm. you know what? I really want to call the uh, the place where the druid. I'm uh, not the druids. The um, the the Fey Pod people, the floaters. The Fey Pod people. Yeah, I want to call that the entire sea area the nursery. Mm, I demand a word in Elvish for that. They yeah. have some awesome word for it in Elvish. Yeah, somebody alphify that for me and get back to us. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. L, it's not a problem to have 60 foot waves if you can fly. Yes. <laughs> Yet another reason it's hard to deal with players that can fly. They can dodge my 60 foot waves. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> going to ruin everybody's day. Actually, that 60 foot wave is how you're going to get everybody to get into the the apparatus of Kalosh or whatever to hide from it. <laughs> but that flyer guy is out in the open now, and now he's out. He now has split the party. Pain in the uh, so the nursery. Yeah. So the nursery is is that interior sea. Okay. There's going to be areas in it that are extremely calm, and most of that interior sea is not very deep. Most of that interior sea is diveable, except when you get towards the, I don't know, the big blue hole or whatever we want to call where the where the where the spacecraft meteorite asteroid hit. Why are you making it a spaceship? I'm not. Why? I'm, Why are you doing this to me? I'm, I'm leaving it open to whoever would like to play in this area, to make it whatever they'd like. Once upon a time, there was a guy named Zeke with an invisible mech. I'll tell you guys that story sometime. <laughs> and, a curl. And, then, and then the floaters had vibranium and uh, yeah, exactly. went crazy. Yeah. There's <laughs> if you ever go to a con and you show up to GM a table and don't really know anything about what you're getting yourself into, they just say, go GM this table. It's an event. And you GM the table and let players bring their own characters expect to have a bad day. <laughs> <laughs> or it's one of the funnest days ever. And just as long oh. as you don't care. So the nursery, um, most of the interior sea mm. is uh, shallow. Okay. And diveable. Especially with the bells. James Leslie brings up a really interesting point that we could super attack with tons of lore. Meteor that left a deposit of adamantite or whatever mystery metal we want to fill that void with Sharks. the only people that can get low enough to get to that that can deal with the water pressure at that level are going to be the people that don't even care about the metal yes the fluffy <laughs> elf people yes so there's a huge opportunity for trade i mean they could mine it for centuries before ever running out. If it's huge, if the deposits like massive and spread out and they have to dig up some of the seafloor, the low seafloor in order what, to get it to it. It made like, like 150 foot uh, impact crater edge. So, I mean, 150, 150. mile impact crater edge. Ooh, it was yeah. like 150 feet made an island. All right. Made all the islands. <laughs> all the islands. Yeah, blast at the, uh, blast at the mountains and Bam. There you go. Okay. Okay. I like that. So the floaters, they've got the nursery. 
which is their giant their giant floating island things yeah, floating island things and the need for the floating islands could have you know some some part they normally live on the shores but they're all these humans and some part they need these to make babies and some part you know what i mean like we could add several elements into it in order to justify its existence pretty easily. So then there's going to be the crater. <laughs> Emiliano Garcia said the meteor that killed the dinosaurs. That's essentially what we're going with, except some dinosaurs lived somewhere like in Forgotten Realms. Um, <laughs> Kyle Ellis said, uh, you're giving me so many ideas. The stream is exactly what I needed. Thank you all. Uh, awesome. Thank you. and Thank you everybody in chat. Uh, you guys are, are how all this gets done. Thank you so much. Yes, thanks for, for joining us and talking about all this stuff with us. Exactly. So the sunken crater, we can say it's um, it's an let's say it's an amalgamation of sweet metals. Sweet metals. Yes, super sweet metals. Super sweet metals. Even better. So basically, anything you want unobtainium in the world, that's where it is. <laughs> unobtainium, and so we could we'll say shark steel. Uh, <laughs> High fives all around, absolutely. Moonlight silver, which are both metals in my world. Uh, mm, true, there's a bunch of a bunch of metals. So what do you what do you have available in Ofganya? Well, uh, Moonlight Silver is a silver ore that has, uh, from some strange way, absorbed the energy of Moonlight. So it's specifically deadly against uh, things that are beholden to the moon or fey. So it's like oh. cold iron for fey, but it's this Moonlit Silver. And it actually glows as well. So it has like a natural silvery mm. sheen, but also a a light glow to it as well uh and it's basically as hard as steel but counts as a silver weapon and mm. also is counts as magic for hitting fake creatures as well lincoln had a good idea for it just bring it, it brings up mental images of what this must look like the 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 these like sea elves swimming super super low and then they he said uh kelp baskets floating bio balloons to get the ore metal to the surface like they attach the huge bio balloons to the base yeah. of this huge chunk of stone or whatever and bring it up to the surface slowly and they're swimming up next to it oh my god Aha. and then <sighs> yes and then you have to have terrible creatures <laughs> That have had, terrible creatures. Yeah, uh, they live in the crater space. Mm. So it's not all fluffy bunnies down there. There's some nasty Absolutely. stuff. Absolutely, Russet Man was driving home the point right now of of that exact thing. Uh, Russet Man on Twitch said the crater should have its own unique life that makes it a little bit dangerous to dive and sail in. Maybe there could be even more problems. We're on the same RPG creative wavelength, I guess. <laughs> Blink sharks. <laughs> <laughs> Displacer no. sharks. Displacer sharks once again. Uh, <laughs> I, yeah. By the way, I love talking about these islands. I don't like the sea. I don't like. I don't like really being in the water. No. Oh, come on. I am. I am a hairless ape that has learned his lesson, oh. and the sea <laughs> is bad, man. Bad stuff there. Um, Mr. L said, no more mysteries about the meteor. Uh, maybe the basic malevolent soul linked to the meteor that was sent to space 1,000 years prior. What? <laughs> so don't type that. <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> Way to go. <laughs> Extra dimensional being. Extra dimensional being. Yes. So it's upset that they keep taking away pieces of it and forging things with no, it? No, it's actually, it's prison that they're un uh, taking apart a piece at a time. <laughs> All right. The irony. All right. Mm. 
Displacer Octopus. Yeah. And I thought Vampire Squid was a scary name. Yeah. Vampire Squid just looks terrifying. Yeah. Mm, Kyle Ellis said, I'm with Nate in real life. If I get wet, uh, it triggers my my uh, PTSD. So I only go uh, get in into it to explore in games. Well, I've, I've got an art background. I've been drawing for a really long time. I don't have the time to draw and paint and do all this kind of, like I do metalworking and stuff as well, which I rarely talk about ever because I haven't done it in so long. Mm. And um, I'm very visually, like I can really visualize something in my head. So as soon as you said like blink shark, I'm thinking sharks like in my face. I'm like, ah, <laughs> <laughs> heck no, I'm not getting in the ocean. I go as far as my kids will go, which means like <laughs> three feet in. I I am I am typically a poor swimmer, but I still love the water. I get in all the time. Uh, large jellyfish-like creatures that use the metals in the crater to coat the outside of their bodies. Uh, something glowing in the night. I really like the idea of the um, the underwater environment being lit up by bioluminescent, uh, even like to a completely unrealistic degree. I absolutely love that idea. So uh, we could throw bioluminescence everywhere. It's fine with me. Well, I mean, that's <laughs> how the, you know, the floaters would naturally have either they'd craft it through fey magic, a way mm -hmm. to see underwater, like light wise. Oh, certainly, certainly. So, or they just have huge, creepy black eyes that so, pick up all the light. Black soulless eyes. Uh, no, I would say, um, you know how like you have, you know, the elven cities at night are enchanting and lit and like magic looking. Well, just imagine that's like underwater and like there's still all the lights and song mm. and stuff going on. Oh yeah, my God, yeah, that's wonderful. Uh, phytoplankton is very bright. The shore of Vancouver Island glows some nights. I like that idea. That's really cool. Hmm. <laughs> Russet man said, remember when you're deep, you don't want to go towards the bright light. <laughs> <laughs> this is true. It's just an angler fish the size of a, a bus. <laughs> the will o wisp of the sea is the giant angler fish. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, so uh, we're drawing up this metal and we're trading it. This is the, the concept that I've been struggling with since we started talking about sea elves and kelp cities and things like that okay what do the elves want from other people what there's tons of cool stuff they have but what do they want because they have, they have plenty of stuff they can get themselves uh, what do the elves want from other people mm -hmm. well they don't have a way of crafting the metals they pick up into anything mm, that's very true Unless they have a good chunk of animantium, like a like a like a forge anvil sized piece, mm -hmm. and they smash the other types of metals with like animant, like they've got like like a, a makeshift hammer made from animantium mm -hmm. rock, like just hey, you get a per perfectly nice sliver that's got a pretty flat face to it, and you strap it to. Uh, whatever wood and other things and kind of like basically you know, make a hammer out of it. You got animantian hammer, you got an animantian fo forge, you hammer mm -hmm. out some other types of softer metal on it. Bam, you could do stuff. Well, Kyle Ellis brings up some interesting points and there's several things I kind of want to attack on this. Kyle Ellis said, uh, the sea elves have no wood. Uh, take a bunch of wood, burn it, starve it of oxygen as it's burning and you end up with charcoal, which is the only thing that burns hot enough to actually smelt metal. Unless we're talking about weird exotic metals. Just well, that's, iron. Why, that's why I would think they would, if they've got adamantium chunks big enough, they could, they could actually have a, like a cold forge. Okay. Especially. Okay. okay so the moonlit, uh, the moonlight silver is actually very malleable. So mm -hmm. maybe they do forge like small daggers and, arrowheads out of this moonlight silver okay all right if if they are able to forge some of the tools that they would want and 
anybody who is a tool user is going to want a better version of the tool that they use every day to complete tasks. And a really nice rust proof tool would be something that they would trade for in a heartbeat. So oh, is yeah, there- Especially if they're, they've got chunks of metal that they brought up from the sea. And right. Like, well, we don't, we're not gonna do anything with this animantian hunk. Right. Cause it's not, it's not in a useful shape. So, uh, oh, epic dwarf stench. Dude, that is an insane idea. Okay, it still creates more problems than things it solves, but uh, he said, what about volcanic sea vents? Literally forging underwater. I do not know how you would be able to work the metal because you need a lot of force, um, but you could certainly get it to a malleable temperature. It would start to quench immediately, but there's a temperature differential outside a volcanic vent. If the water around it's cold enough, you might be able to get something in there right into the hot and then pull it out quickly. I'm not, I'm not really sure how that would work. If it's hot enough to melt metal, chances are the water near it is extremely hot. Yeah, it'd be boiling all the time. Yeah. Oh, or, or the, well, with certain amounts of pressure, you're going to have really hot water that isn't boiling. So really hot salt water that isn't boiling. That's some nasty stuff. Exactly. Exactly. We're I, I like this. I like the idea. I like the idea of some kind of like, you know, forging an underwater mountain doom kind of feeling to it. But uh, mm -hmm. I don't know. Maybe they. I'd like the idea of them trading the stuff that they they can't like. So maybe they use a little out of this moonlight silver that they pick up. And that's kind of the stuff they hold on to. Mm, it's almost like a okay. trademark of their of their people is that that this is one of the major things they use aside from other natural materials for all their stuff. Okay. And they they oh. trade away like the platinums, the gold, and other things in it. Mm. Uh, Kyle Ellis and uh, Sage McKenzie uh, bro both bring up a perfectly reasonable explanation, saying that uh, you could. Uh, theoretically, if you can cast shape water or something like that to a strong enough degree, you could use that to shape metal or uh, use that to work a forge, which you couldn't otherwise be near, that kind of thing. Well, I mean, you also have these abilities to make... Uh, do they have something where you can make a bubble of air? I bet if you if you cast... That's another thing we like, underwater. Oh, this Friday, we could totally do an underwater magic and other things discussion. <laughs> hmm. How does stuff work underwater? Because if you did wall of air or gust of wind underwater, would you create a little pocket of bubble of something? Would you? Uh, uh, Friday. Okay. Yeah. 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 Friday. 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 <laughs> Not now. Not now. Not now. But Not now. perhaps we'll talk about how they could smelt things later in the week. Mm, yes. Oh no! This not this Friday. Oh no! It's Friday. No, not this uh, streaming uh, RPG crate game. Well, I don't want to miss that. Come no, on. I don't either. So <laughs> maybe we can cram it in a little bit on Thursday, just like a quick little monster mash here. There, little... there, we should be realistic. There will not be time to cram anything in other than the insane number of ideas that come from chat for horrible stuff to kill you. There's gonna be so like many squid-looking creatures. Yes, like blink sharks or uh, teleporting piranhas or whatever the other things I saw. Gigantic worms, giant sea worms. <laughs> a massive number of horrible things to slaughter you. Yes, this um, is true. If I have no uh, tonight, I don't know. <laughs> Axonar said, uh, extract oxygen, hydrogen from the seawater, contain it, and burn it in a controlled manner. That is an incredibly complex process for people that live in kelp bubbles. Yeah, I think um, I could see that being how the things float, actually. Maybe they explode if you if they come in contact with an ignition source. Exactly. The kelp exactly. naturally hydrolyzes water and you get hydrogen, oxygen, electrolyte. You know, basically through solar energy electrolyzes the stuff and you get oxygen and hydrogen. And that's what actually makes it buoyant. Mm -hmm. So if you were to pipe it's into a... the a whole bunch of those, you could make a blast furnace. That's oh, God. that's a hydrogen, basically like rocket fuel kind of thing. 
Dude, what if, what if some of the pods are just full of hydrogen gas? It's a nice Just hot flame. The, the plant produces this slightly oxygenated, primarily hydrogen gas. I mean, they'd blow up even underwater if they had oxygen to burn. Mm -hmm. well, <laughs> jazz hands, magic jazz hands. What if? Yeah, I know. I'm talking my hands too much. Hey, we only get uh, so much box down here. Exactly. Doesn't magnesium burn underwater? Yes, it does. If it's ignited, yes. I believe it does. Uh, Emiliano Garcia said, uh, maybe we can introduce a metal that's always on fire, but solid. Like a metal, it's underwater, so it's reacting with... But the, the reaction with water destroys the metal. Hmm. Well, like a sodium? Well, not, yeah, How exactly. Like, like sodium. Hot reaction. Exactly. Well... Well, man okay, but you talked about magnesium thermite, which is um, iron oxide. Was it aluminum oxide and iron, or iron oxide and aluminum? I'm not familiar. Okay, so basically, thermite is iron and aluminum. One of them is oxide, and you ignite it with like magnesium or something else like that, and it will start to react. You end hmm. up with iron. It must be iron oxide because you end up with iron. So it's it's way you can weld um, railroad tracks together. Hmm. So you butt up two railroad lines. You know it's the steel beams that the rail lines are, and you make a like mold around it, and then you fill it with thermite, and then you ignite the thermite, and then bam, that's gonna it gets so hot it just welds it. Interesting. So technically, hmm. you could do something like that, but again, that's gonna be. It's getting a little too feeling of like we want to make a forge and foundry with these metal things for these nature hippie people. So we're kind of it's like <laughs> it's getting too contrived. I think you know what I mean. Right. It. I was happy with the idea that they would purchase all of their metals and things like that. They'd be like, oh, we came up with this huge chunk of metal that's worth, you know, fifty thousand gold to the people on mainland, but they don't know that, so they give it away for you know some swords and spears and yeah, whatever. Yeah, well, they item. trade. Yeah, and they and they've over the years have feel, figured out they're not going to get hoodwinked. They they figured out like <laughs> I well, like them getting hoodwinked. <laughs> these people these people trade us uh, more than these people, so we'll just tell these people that the other guys trade us more. So you better any up, and then eventually there's going to be a point where they're like, heck no, I'm not giving you anything else. I'm barely going to make a dime, and really mean it. And then they'll be like, mm -hmm. oh, okay, I guess we can't ask for more stuff. Mm. So they're going to be ignorant of the actual value but they're going to gain it through uh interaction they're going to understand over the decades of the interaction between it as more and more people are trying to vie for access to these nice metals hmm. all right so i'm sure at some point they did get um ripped off quite significantly but hmm. they're they're at least getting a better deal now and to them it's hmm. worthless you know, aside from the stuff they can forge with animantian, uh, animantian forge and uh, hammer, this stuff's pretty much worthless to them, except for trinkets. Mm, uh, Kyle Ellis said it would be so much easier to trade for metal than to forge it, and that's kind of that's kind of the direction I was going in. Is it just because they we have to have them need to trade for some commodity at this point because they. They already have access to the bounty of the sea. They have their own living condition. They have most of what they need. Yeah. It's just for special things that they can't make themselves, like forged forged items. Mm-hmm. Um, beyond the moon silver the moonlight silver. And um other things that they might find interesting, like, oh, you know, maybe they want some kind of outfit, or maybe they want some kind of a crafted vessel that just looks nice that they're not gonna grow themselves or something. Exactly. There's other exactly. There's things people want for, you know, just sheerly because, hey, you know, it's like a status thing to have it. It's pretty. Yeah. And the faith, I, you know, they've got the whimsical faith thing to them, so they could find really anything interesting to have for status. Maybe I have... they could even want people. <laughs> they could be, <laughs> well, seriously, they could be part of the slave trade in a sense. What would they do with people? Food? 
We're, we're... No, no, no. Like <laughs> the oddity, almost like you know how like gins kind of collect pe- can collect people. Do you know what I mean? Like it's that same oh, kind of like, green dragons do that too. Like oddities, yeah. like hey, you know, we got all this metal, but we don't have all these interesting people. Right. So there might be an entire group of um, they'd probably call them something special. Um, like, oh, you, they probably can... call them guests, but they're not really guests. Yeah. <laughs> In the typical Faye fashion. They're called <laughs> guests to everybody else, but they're not actually guests. I like that idea. I like that idea. Maybe we should do some research into things. Uh, the Green Dragon has a penchant for uh, keeping a collection of, of people it's manipulating. So, um, so yeah, D and D and science get crazy. Absolutely, Emiliano. There is actually this is something cool for you guys to look up. There's a really cool chemical that in uh, classical eras they would add to water. And then they'd take something like a pewter goblet or a silver goblet uh, and they'd set it in it and they'd pour some wine in the goblet and the chemical reacts with the water and it cools the, uh, the, the goblet down and the drink in it. So you can actually, if you want to throw something interesting in your game, uh, you can actually charge your players extra money for cooled drinks. Uh, and it was, it was very common, like farmers can make it. They had to, they had to start giving it to the king for, uh, in uh, Europe for making gunpowder at one point. So check that out oh. check your I google an skills answer, so I'm, i won't say anything you have an answer i'm not gonna say oh anything. don't ruin it don't i, don't. I, I know we'll leave mm. it for later so trade mm. metals they trade they trade metals mm-hmm. they trade metals for pe- peculiarities so that can be anything from uh status symbols of clothing mm, yeah to people Hmm. Uh, who are in parentheses guests oh, there's so many cool ideas now okay so before I've got yes. some players playing in the merchant circle There, <laughs> I, I mentioned something about pirates in the port city that's about a week's travel from where they were in Stationton and they're two they're actually like two weeks away from the port city I mentioned okay. pirates in rumors, so I was like, "Please don't go down there yet." <laughs> Thankfully, they went into the mines. So, you know, they're they're two weeks. They're like a week in the mines and two weeks away from travel. So they've got quite a while before they're gonna mess with the the sea. But I was like, you know what? I don't want to play there yet. I don't know why I mentioned the pirates. It was just like I wanted a var- Honestly, I wanted a variety of rumors. And you know mm-hmm. that can get you in deep. That can get you in deep as a DM because you can just put. The, you can toss in a throwaway rumor, and they're like, "That is the main quest." He mentioned yeah. it. It's obviously something huge. And I'm like, "Crap! I don't have. Z- I've got zilch." So I've been like working on the islands in my head. I'm like, "I gotta figure this out because I mentioned it. They could possibly decide to go there." So I'm like cranking out mm-hmm. some stuff, and then this is now I'm excited to play in this place. Oh, real quick, Axenar. That idea, he said, a water spider that makes a web that catches fish. And then you could make clothing out of the silk that comes from the spider. Oh, I like that. Keep that locked in your brain tight because we need that for Monster Mash. That is an awesome idea. That's I like that idea. idea. Uh, Lincoln raises an interesting question. We are very quickly running out of time, but uh, he raised an interesting question. He said, human pirates? And are they all human? Oh, what human we... pirates? Question mark. Yes, they don't have to all be human. That's that's not. Necessary. I wouldn't think they would be mercenaries from all over the place. I mean, uh, you, there's lots of work and lots of money to be made. People from everywhere would show uh, up with something that happened in the region is 500 years ago. The Moor Danes, which was the major dwarven community in the area, either disappeared or the or left the mountains. So there's probably be a lot of dwarves in in privateering they would definitely be wanting to be called privateers i think for the most part uh and they also there's something called the three peaks company which is a major organization in the the mercenary in the mercenary guild re, like kind of level of power and their major their major place is astoria which is about two weeks out from dresden which is the port city so the closest so they could easily be privateers hired by a legit like fighting force that says yeah we're getting rid of the pirates in the area or at least 
making them scared and making them mm. kind of like lower their their activity for a bit. And it's kind of like a game. It's like it's like the pirates are organized crime and mm-hmm. the mercenaries and other things that are sent out could be also privateers but are are kind of like hired by certain merchant companies to deal with the pirates but you're never going to really get rid of them you're always just going to make them go okay let's give them a couple months of space and then we'll get back to our old ways of doing stuff Mm -hmm. that's how i that's how i see it anyway so there could easily be a large population of dwarven um either people going after the pirates or on the seas just in general and i can see the the gnomes being very interested in the in the types of pure resources that are gathered from the floaters as well as from the the tar sands <laughs> the tar sands mm, place. yeah so the tar sands. smoker island smoker island uh, yeah. <laughs> just just homage to water world nothing wrong with that the e uh, smoker island so we are going to have to wrap this up so we want to do a little recap mm, like super yes. quick ninja style so we have the island chain of the merchant circle there's the three city states the coral reef labyrinth the tar sands or the industrial place which has ancient ruins alchemical petroleum it's got salt wa- fresh water processing then we've got a series of island that does mostly fish trade probably where the pirates kind of hang out when they're when they're not um, at their barge city so there's going to mm. be i would say the I- ser- major theme of the series of islands is there's more than you need to do whatever you're going to do and so we'll we can write that in a later date or just you know, make it up on the fly as you go along and just add adventures to it so uh the races and monster and interior sea you've got the floaters which are the fl- fey dryads which they probably have a name for themselves it'll be some kind of elveny thing mm-hmm. and uh born from pods like floating seaweed pieces and they <laughs> they live on a what they call the nursery which is all the area the interior of the interior sea of the merchant circle chain of islands and that is kind of their their place that they live so they live on like floating tree mass of roots and kelp and other things and they've uh the, they've got the free smoker island which has the four families that control all these different tra- highly tradable resources and they also would probably be a place where they would refine off the toss in there that someone refines metal because mm-hmm. i would think that they would try probably try and get the most stuff out of the 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 uh floaters as they could oh yeah so i think someone's gonna have to refine metal so we'll just have to pick out who that who that actually is at a later time yeah exactly, exactly. and uh got the religious theocracy of the magic coral labyrinth uh, and they put their people in when they die they've got basically the coral crypts or they bury them within the coral bury them awesome idea um yes really cool idea and that can be everything from elaborate coral coffins crafted from things that people gather from the surrounding area and the you know the beaches as well as the sea uh, to something as simple as you know you you float them out on a small like surfboard size piece of wood and then <laughs> parts of the reef come up to grab them and draw them down kind of mm-hmm. like a very like Viking funeral kind of thing that that what is that called burial the one you see the one you see in movies where they light the boats on fire and oh i have no idea if that actually happened i just know that i've associated with vikings based off movies there there were boat burials they did not always include fire but there were yeah burials where they would put one or many warriors on ships and send them off to sea so and the floaters live in the nursery which is mostly the interior sea which is shallow and diveable especially with their organic bioorganic bells made from giant things of seaweed and kelp and um they trade in the metals that they find in the uh basically the deepest part of the nursery which you could just call the crater abyss or the sunken crater which is where all the nice rare metals can be found that were originally in the thing that crashed into the the mountain which formed this this kind of like sea with the thank you for not calling it a spaceship (laughs) anything that you desire could be it just make it out of metal and you'll be fine and then there's going to be terrible creatures probably living in that crater space to make it kind of like dangerous and nasty and that is the entirety of what we worked on today so thank you very much for joining us 
And um, got anything left? No, that's right. it. So thank you for joining us. Uh, you can check out the YouTubes for any types of comments if you wanted to add stuff to this later. And you can also uh, check us out at nerdicky.com for some sweet swag and other things. So until next time, stay nerdy. Stay nerdy.